scorn, scorn, scorn. 2022, the Blackburns scraped past England in an epic World Cup final. The Stormers secured the inaugural URC title and Eddie Jones got sacked by England. But in amongst little piss boy playing the referee like a fiddle and fiddling too hard with a ref who won't be budged, this was a year in which some rugby was played by some people and celebrate the best of that rugby. It's time for this, the Squid Rugby Team of the Year. And buckle up gang, it's now time for the heartbeat of the team. It's time for the best halfbacks of 2022. Even as rugby moves forwards, as it dives into new eras of entire teams with all court games, shapes called by centres, game plans dictated entirely by our two coaches, second rows who can pass better than 12s could 10 years ago, props who were literally tied furlong, no matter how those things change, the fly half shirt still holds a certain majesty. There's a credit and identity to the number 10 that it's the player that you build your team around. The fulcrum who sums up what your side are trying to achieve. And in a year where one old head really established himself as his nation's most pivotal player, maybe of all time, it felt so exciting to see that aura, that identity, and something that will one day no doubt be a legacy spread to new parts of the world. Because without a moment's doubt, without a second's consideration of others, frankly, the undeniable 10 in the team of the year 2022 is Chile's Rodrigo Fernandez. Nobody, and I'll repeat that again, nobody has torn up both the international game and the sports expectations over the last 18 months like Fernandez. Whilst coach Pablo Lemoyne has worked miracles in preparing his team and his forward pack has done unbelievably well to match every contender they've come up against, ones with far more pedigree and professionalism behind them, Fernandez had given the Rugby World Cup's newest side a real cutting edge. Chile had never played a T1 team before Scotland set foot in Santiago and Fernandez himself has said since he couldn't believe how fast the game was in the first 15 minutes, how fast Scotland were playing. Yet not only did he adapt almost instantly, he thrived, ripping the Scots defence open over and over and taking the confidence that that gave him into the two biggest games, not just of his life, but of his country's rugby playing existence. This solo try made him a global sensation. And with good reason, he's tearing open the USA on a quagmire. It's absolutely unbelievable. But to only talk about that try is a disservice to his all-round performance in that game, where he kept Chile going excellently, he played just superbly, kicked really well, and also gave an assist right at the end to keep Chile in the game as they headed into the second leg and there he just got even better. Fernandez is in the rare category of players who you feel could create a try every single touch he gets and he proved that here creating a score for the outstanding fullback Santiago Villafella out of completely nothing. You're looking at this and not thinking there's a try on and yet here we are Villafella scoring in the corner moments later. His form continued not just into the autumn where he almost helped Chile to what would have been a huge huge result away draw against Romania but into the club game, where he was a key player for Selknam as they made their first SLAR final, upsetting the previously unbeaten in three years Jaguares to get there. If how the players we're watching make us feel counts for anything, and on this list it really does, there can never be any doubt over the place in this team of Rodrigo Fernandez. Here's the thing. It's Antoine Dupont. This was a year that saw him sit out another summer and then see red against South Africa, yet there remains daylight between the easiest world-class player to draw up word boxers and every other scrum half in the world. In fact, the nine who pushed him hardest was his Toulouse et France counterpart, Laurie Sanzus, only to see her World Cup ended by a nasty injury against England. Antoine Dupont is a rugby player who makes you believe in magic and possibly a higher form of evolution. He makes you believe anything might be possible. He's perhaps not the perfect technical specimen that the next best male scrum halves, Faf de Klerk, Aaron Sneck, Jameson Gibson Park are, but Dupont is a freak. A player who does things that you couldn't achieve with a lifetime's worth of hard work. And yet, he continues to put that work in. This year, we've seen Dupont's kicking game come on enormously. Not that it was ever a weakness, but it's now gone from functional to weapon. 
just because he needed more of those, you know, he needed more outstanding parts of his game. He always had the accuracy for cross kicks like this, but he's added a good, what, like 15, 20, maybe even 30 metres onto the thumps, getting France out of trouble repeatedly during some sticky situations during that eventually unbeaten year. It allowed his influence on the game to remain, even when space was of a premium, even when a team like Wales here in the Six Nations has an incredibly good job of shutting down his attacking flair, yet his core skills now are so good that he can operate as a kind of traditional scrum half that's still having a great game when given none of the time or space or opportunity to do things that only Antoine Dupont and any of his evolved version of the species can do, which is nobody else, let me be very clear. Maybe Sun Zeus. And maybe Santiago Arata actually going off how he's been playing for cast. Dupont was already the best number nine in the world, but this year he might have become the best scrum half as well. Honourable mentions! Sanzus and her fiancé Pauline Bourdon are regular fixtures bubbling under list and they deserve to be here, both playing extremely well for France. Sanzus really brilliant but unlucky with that injury, then Bourdon being a key key part in them being guiding towards that third place medal. And they're once again joined on this list by Aaron Smith, who may have been in a misfiring All Blacks team this year but played some of his best rugby with the added responsibility under Joe Schmidt's new attacking focus, just brilliant for the All Blacks. Samuel Marquez was a metronome for Portugal, keeping the scoreboard ticking and the team making sensible decisions before but ultimately then stepping in in the biggest game to nail the biggest kick in maybe his nation's history. Leanne Infante was as great as she was loud, bossing England into that World Cup final, one intrusive shout over the ref mic at a time. Shinzo Abe might be the most fun rugby player to ever play, Four foot nine of pure quick taps. Little Piss Boy did some big dick plays this year. And whilst Wales were broadly shit in 2022, almost everything they did well came down to the nuts and bolts play of Kieran Williams keeping them from imploding with odd moments of magic from um, Thomas Williams as well. But it was also a big year for the two J something P's. Jack Van Porfley and Jameson Gibson Park. The former having a real breakthrough year, establishing himself as the main rival for Ben Youngs. The two of them surely going to have an epic battle for the England Ninja and Lesser Tigers Ninja for at least the 17 seasons more before Youngs retires. Ben Youngs, by the way, also had a real good year. He's flying over the radar, but he's good. Gibson Park, meanwhile, added the pace and accuracy to Ireland's play. He's become such a crucial part of everything that went so right for them this year. Really could have taken that nine jersey. But speaking of things going right. Ruhe Dumont was a crucial part of everything that went right for the Black Ferns this year and honestly came as close to kicking Fernandes out of the team as humanly possible. She was exceptional. Led her team to glory for a smart attacking game backed up by a kicking game that she pulled out the locker for the final and semi-final to really boss the best oppositions out there. She was brilliant. She was an incredibly close second choice behind Fernandes. Her opponent in that final, Zoe Harrison, also had an excellent year, as did Italy's Veronica Madia, hitting real form in the World Cup to get the most out of a talented backline around her. It was just, just excellent. Marcus Smith might have started the season Season drowning in the biggest hype train circle jerk rugby has produced since Johnny Wilkinson retired, but shone through it to get so much better as the year went on, developing a patience and intelligence to add to his already outstanding running game. Marcus Smith's resilience deserves a mention on its own. Paolo Garbisi guided Italy to a run of enormously improved performances and was critical in Montpellier taking the French title. The USA may have had a tricky year, but AJ McGinty deserves all the credit in the world for his impact on improving that side every time he stepped into play. Those guys, Bowden Barrett, and Richie Moanga are pretty good as well. Roman Untermack gave France real structure, discipline as ever, while Matthew Jalibert added the fun whenever he'd come off the bench there. That pair of tens also outstanding. And I think that's about it. I don't think there's anyone else. The Springboks didn't have a fly half, so is there anyone in green up there? I don't think there's any other fly offs. I don't think there's anyone else I possibly could have mentioned. So I'll see you tomorrow for the front row. But no, okay. I am, of course, joshing. Jam trick sex ceremony proved one of rugby's eternal rules yet again this year. Never write that guy off. Every time you think he's done, he comes back to prove you wrong. And every time you say that he's the best in the world, he gets injured or implodes at a World Cup, so you can really thank me for selecting Fernandez over him next year. It sounds like a cliche, but it's one of the truest things in rugby. If Sex Grant plays well, Ireland play well. And this year, he played really bloody well. When in the kind of form we saw Sex Laptop in this season, he's unflappable, unbreakable, and his team nearly unbeatable. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're a Leicester fan, I want to quickly apologise for not picking Luke McGraw in the team. I know how that'll upset you. Um, and I want to say if you're one of the many people that has left some really quite misogynistic comments about the fact that there were women in the team, um, then go away. And you can come back for the World Cup or whatever if you want, but like I won't miss you. 
Uh, in the meantime, they'll be moving on to the forwards tomorrow with the props, the front row, and I'll see you then for that, unless you're one of the people that went away, in which case, bye. <laughs>